Welcome to the last of our modules, Module 7, where we will talk about the last chapter of OpenStax Astronomy, Chapter 30. But before we do that, we need to talk about the solar system. And so this is when we actually cover chapters 7 through 14 of OpenStax Astronomy, just the very brief highlights of objects in our solar system. So we'll start out in Chapter 7, which is an introduction to the solar system. And it's important that we understand something right away. Almost every single picture that shows up in textbooks and in popular media and even in searches online will show you a um, picture of objects that are not an accurate scale model. Often they will either be showing you all of the objects to scale relative in size or they will be showing you the orbits at the correct scale, but then have greatly expanded the objects themselves. So the particular picture that we're looking at here on our, sli on our slide right now is showing all of the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, to scale with each other, and some of the major moons of those objects also to scale. At the bottom right, we have, and I'll show it here with the mouse, at the bottom right, we have the correct distances as well. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars all clustered close together. Ceres is here in the asteroid belt, and then the outer planets are greatly spaced far apart, and Pluto is out in what's called the Kuiper belt. We will learn these different terms as we go through this module. So we need to recognize right away that any prior understanding of what our solar system looks like and the sizes involved probably has a lot of misconceptions built in because of these incorrect pictures that we've been shown all our lives. Now, I really like this set of um, resources. So the very first one is an interactive website. You can go to it and it will be a fully correct scale model of our solar system that you can scroll through either very quickly or you can scroll through at the speed of light to actually get a sense of the fact that it takes light several minutes of time to travel from the sun all the way to earth. Space is a lot bigger than we really think about. And although we've tried to build up a little bit of understanding over the past several modules when it comes to the distance between stars, or even when we were talking about eclipses, the distance between the Earth and the Moon, this really gives us a bigger understanding of that. The second link here, NASA Solar System, it's a three-dimensional model you can fly through. And not listed in this particular slide, but Worldwide Telescope also has a three-dimensional model that you can play around with. You can just Google Worldwide Telescope. And then the last one here is going to be a supplementary video in this playlist um, on YouTube. And it's a group of people who built a correct scale model of the solar system um, that was seven miles wide. And it's a really cool video. It's one of my favorites um, that I show all semester. So I highly recommend um, making time for that one, maybe a couple of times. All right, so to get to what we mean by our solar system, we need to recognize a couple of key things. First of all, capital solar system means our particular sun and the things that orbit it. Any star may have its own system of planets. That's one of the things we'll be getting to later in the module. But for our particular solar system, we have one star, the sun, and the sun is about 99.8% of the total mass in the entire solar system. We don't have to memorize that number, but I do want us to understand that the reason everything seems like it just orbits the sun is because the sun has so much mass. We talked about binary star systems where two stars orbit each other, and that's because they have similar amounts of mass. Now in our solar system, we have eight official planets. There are four inner planets and four outer planets, and we'll be talking about the differences between those two and where those dis differences came from. We also have five dwarf planets. The five have a, has an asterisk because there may be more. If you're watching this and it's not the current year that I recorded these, but currently the accepted list of official dwarf planets includes Ceres, which was promoted from being just an asteroid, 
and Pluto, which was demoted from being a ninth planet. And things that were discovered as we were creating this um, definition or after we had created this definition include Haumea, Makemake, and Eris. And then in our solar system, there is also cosmic debris. And this module is actually going to spend more time thinking about the cosmic debris than it will about the planets. We are not a solar systems course. That is a separate course available um, both at GRCC and at other institutions. Um, but what I do want us to be able to think about is some of the big picture understanding of why this cosmic debris is important to study and how they differ from each other. And that's why there's going to be more of an emphasis on those than like memorizing random facts about the planets. Okay. Now, a lot of us have probably heard some of the debate about Pluto being a planet or not being a planet. And I want to make sure we understand why things ended up the way that they did. When Eris, the object, was first discovered, we all of a sudden, as a astronomy scientific community, had to come to terms with the fact that there was no official definition of a planet. That may surprise you, but what we need to pay attention to is the fact that planets, at least six of them, were known since ancient times, thousands of years ago, Planets are distinguishable visually from stars. The word planet comes from the Greek for wanderer. Planets move across the background stars over the course of weeks and months, and they're trackable. So we never had a need to say what was a planet and what's not because it just felt obvious enough. As our technology got better and better at finding smaller objects, we needed to rec recognize that there needs to be a cutoff of what we consider a planet or not. So the first draft that came about in 2005, and this is the International Astronomical Union, a committee sat down to develop a official definition for the planet. The first draft said that a planet is a celestial body that has sufficient mass for its self-gravity to overcome rigid body forces so that it assumes a hydrostatic equilibrium shape. That first statement is a very sciencey way of saying it's round. And two, it is in orbit around a star and is neither a star nor a satellite of a planet. So that one is saying there needs to be orbits happening, but we don't want to put binary stars into this definition. We don't want to put our moon into this definition. And so we get that um, set of criteria. If that's what we had agreed upon, then there would be 12 planets in our solar system with more to come. And this was at, in the year 2005. At this point, if we'd accepted this criteria, then there would be even more than 12, 14. Ceres underlined here was an asteroid at the time. Pluto and its moon Charon are actually kind of like a binary system themselves. And then Eris was that new discovery that prompted this definition requirement. So we thought to ourselves, this is probably a, an issue because we'll keep discovering things and they will continue to be smaller and weirder and we don't want to force our elementary school students to memorize all of those. <laughs> so the official definition that was accepted in 2006 is that a planet is, in a, is a celestial body that is in orbit around the sun. So we decided that it is going to be specific to our solar system to be a planet and if it's not in our solar system, it's an exoplanet. Number two has sufficient mass to assume hydrostatic equilibrium. Again, that's the fancy way of saying it has enough mass to be round. And then three, it has cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. That additional third step of the um, official definition is what forced Pluto out of the list and Ceres as well. Clear the neighborhood really means that it is the primary force of gravity in its general area. Ceres is part of the asteroid belt with lots of other mass, um, massive objects around. Pluto is out in the Kuiper belt. We'll be learning about that term um, in a bit, where there's lots of other material around, including Eris, Haumea, and Makemake. So with this official definition that we've used since 2006, there are eight planets in our solar system. 
And those eight planets really do behave differently than the dwarf planets that we have. The dwarf planets all have tilted elliptical orbits. They didn't really form at the same time through the same processes that the eight planets that we kept did. It is a valid cutoff when we start to look at how these different objects behave and how they compare to each other. All right, so a brief overview of the inner planets. When we use the phrase inner planets, that's just describing where they are. They are sometimes also called terrestrial planets. Terrestrial comes from the phrase Earth-like. And they are also sometimes called the rocky planets. All of those terms are interchangeable for the same four objects pictured here. Mercury is the smallest of the four. Earth is only just barely the biggest of the four. Venus is sometimes called our sister planet. It does have a very similar mass and radius um, and a very thick atmosphere and is kind of a worst case scenario for some of the stuff we'll be talking about later in this module. The outer planets are also sometimes called, so outer planets indicates where they are. They are sometimes called the Jovian planets. Jovian means Jupiter-like, so it's kind of like the things that look like Earth or the things that look like Jupiter. And then they are sometimes called giant planets or even gas giant planets. They are mostly made of gas and ices, and they are significantly larger. So now all eight planets are in this picture here, but we can see the original four that we were talking about a moment ago. Uranus and Neptune are the two blue planets. They are very similar in size and mass to each other. Neptune is the one on the right that has the great dark spot that was um, seen when Voyager went past it in the 80s and has since dissipated. Saturn is really well known for its ring system, but it is something worth recognizing that all four of the outer planets actually do have ring systems, um, just less extensive and less visible in optical wavelengths um, compared to Saturn. Jupiter has the great dark spot. It's a massive storm that is bigger than the planet um, Earth. And it's really kind of well known for its banded structure, although all of these have very similar properties of how their atmospheres behave. Now I want us to think about the fact that all of these objects now are being compared to the size of the sun. We had already talked briefly in chapter four that the sun is a hundred times bigger across than the earth is. We needed to kind of get a sense of that scale for us to be able to discuss why eclipses can happen and why solar eclipses are actually kind of rare and um, a coincidence for us, thinking about the moon, its location, its size, the sun, its location, its size. Now I want us to think before we move on to make sure that we're processing these sizes um, completely. And I want us to recognize something that should take critical thinking skills without requiring us to look up numbers of any kind. Consider the eight planets in our solar system, and I want you to pause once I'm done talking here. I want you to group them in pairs by size, so I'll help you out. Earth and Venus are similar in size to each other. And then rank those pairs from sm smallest to largest in your notes. And again, we shouldn't have to look up any numbers to do this. I want you to see how, how we're feeling about this. Okay. So all four of the inner planets are the smallest by far. We saw pictures just a moment ago of how Mercury and Mars are the smaller ones. So Mercury and Mars would be the first pair. Then would be Earth and Venus. Then Uranus and Neptune, those two blue planets that showed up in the previous um, picture. And then Jupiter and Saturn are by far the largest of the planets. Now I'm hoping that we felt like that was a pretty easy, straightforward task for us. And I want us to recognize something important here. It should be reasonable for me to ask on a worksheet or an assignment or a quiz or a test or whatever, it should be reasonable for me to ask you which is larger, Saturn or Neptune. And we should be able to do that without feeling like we had to memorize their sizes. It would be unreasonable for me to ask you which is larger, Uranus or Neptune. I won't ask you that question. The two planets that we grouped together, they are similar enough in size that I'm not asking us to get the exact 
write numbers to know which one is slightly bigger than the other. So it's a chance for us to recognize that there are reasonable questions that don't require us to memorize numbers, and there are unreasonable questions that I wouldn't ask that to really feel confident you would have to look up numbers. We will be seeing size and scale ranking tasks, and I want you to keep this in mind as you complete those um, in the assignments for this, for this module. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about in this very first video is very briefly discussing section 7.3 from the textbook. I want us to be aware that um, the process of taking ages of objects in our solar system, I want us to be aware that there are methods. I don't need us for the curriculum that we have, for the timing that we have. I don't need us to fully understand those processes. If this were a geology course, it would be an, a more important topic for us. But I just want us to be aware of them because we always want to know where our knowledge comes from because that's part of the scientific process. So if we're trying to get the surface age of an object in our solar system, one thing that is really helpful to do is to count the number of craters that we see. More craters means that surface has been around untouched by any processes for a lot longer than a surface with less craters. The image on this uh, slide is the far side of the moon, but the reason that the moon has more craters than the earth is because the earth's surface is actually kind of young. We will be talking in chapter 8 about the fact that the earth has this recycling process for its surface through plate tectonics, as well as erosion um, processes that happen because of the water that we have. So surface ages can be useful when we're comparing things like Mars and, um, and Mercury, figuring out if there's any processes that are erasing craters. But it isn't useful for getting the actual age of how long has this object existed. To do that, we use radioactive dating. Now, this is a topic that we could easily spend half an hour talking about, and there might still be some misunderstanding about it. And so I want us to recognize that this is not a key part of our curriculum. And so we don't need to feel fully confident on how this whole thing works, but it would be worth kind of reading through um, the chapter briefly. But the way that this works is some elements, if you leave them alone, they will spontaneously turn into a different element. This is called parent and daughter elements. And the process by which that happens is very statistical. It's like if you roll a dice, um, a six-sided die, if you roll it a whole bunch of times, then about a sixth of the time it should come up as a one. About a sixth of the time it should come up as a two. And if you roll it enough times, then all of that works out. Radioactive dating works the same kind of way. Each individual atom is choosing whenever to decay, but as we have enough of those atoms over a long enough span of time, there is a very statistical way of describing that decay. It takes a phrase called half-lives, where that is the actual amount of time where statistically half of the sample that was the parent element has turned into the daughter element. But if we look at this picture here, that means that if we're looking at the first half-life, we had all parent, and now we're half-parent, half-daughter. But if we started at half-life one, and now we're looking at half-life two, it's half of the parent stuff is turning into the daughter element. We go from half of it to a fourth. Now again, I don't want us to get feeling like we're bogged down in the math. I just want us to recognize that if we had a sample where we're holding it in our hands and we recognize that there's a 16th of the daughter element, uh, sorry, a 16th of the parent element and 15 sixteenths of the daughter element, that we could use a chart like this or the equations that show up in the textbook to recognize that four half-lives have occurred. We're not going to do any of those calculations in this particular course that I'm describing but I do want us to recognize that it is possible to do those calculations. It is possible for scientists to use several different combinations of elements to each get a measurement of how old an object 
or rock is. Rocks on Earth have measured ages up to 4.4 billion years old. There are plenty of rocks that are a lot younger. If they were just formed, especially through volcanic processes or sedimentary processes, they might not be that old. But the oldest rocks we find are that amount. The moon rocks that were brought back from the Apollo missions, they are all equally the same age and all older than that 4.4 billion years old. And meteorites, we will talk more about those in this module, but meteorites, when they hit Earth's surface, we can immediately do radioactive dating on them, and they have measured ages as high as 4.56 billion years old. All of these values are basically telling us approximately how long in the past we had these rocks originally form when the solar system was forming and we were finally making solid rocks instead of clouds of gas and dust. So we, we will be talking about the formation of the solar system in the next video. And I just want to leave us with an understanding that these ages are not coming out of nowhere. There are observations that can be made to confirm them. So I will see you in that next video.